Uh, all right, real quick, back to the the uh, bank special deposit account. There's a question whether or not that should be interest or non-interest bearing. Uh, well, uh, yeah, you don't. <laughs> okay. Interest um, would be a benefit if you if you collect interest. That's a benefit. Right? That's right. Interest is a benefit, but but you I would not be requesting interest because a special deposit. Uh, from from what my understanding is, and I'm and, and and I may be corrected on this, so please uh, take this as the best of my knowledge. The best of my knowledge is special deposit accounts do not attract interest. Well, that would make sense because um, it would be a situation where you're not we're not um, you're you're stepping outside of that box, that system, Correct. and uh, that is a benefit for inside that box. So we're not eligible for that benefit. Correct. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, question <laughs> from <laughs> question from Ron. Hello, Ron. Are you uh, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Frank. Hello. Ron, how you doing? I'm going well. Good. Hey, I have some further information on filing on SS4 online, and it's a trick by the IRS. Uh, the first two items they ask you is check check these boxes for trust, right? The third item is who is the responsible party, which is really box seven on the on the written form. They will not let you go past box seven without putting a name and a social security or an EIN number in there. So what I did was I faxed it to a special number and they will fax it back when they get done with it. We've already got one back. Excellent. Uh, here's the fax number. It's it's one number for all the United States. It is eight five nine six six nine five seven six zero. Now, Ron, can I ask you? As as uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure you'll you'll do. Can you send me an email, and then for the benefit of everybody, we'll update that section. In the uh, in the notes on the ecclesiastical deed information, yeah, uh, absolutely. Be glad. Ron, thank you so much for that, and thank you for all you're doing too. By the way, you're welcome. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Ron. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Rob. Let me get Rob on the line here. Hello, Rob. Can you hear us? Rob, are you there? Rob Ryder. Hello, Rob. Hmm. Rob, you'll have to get That's back right. in the queue. Sorry about that. All right, Ford Man. Oh, we have Ford Man on the line. Let me get him unmuted. All right, yes. Ford Man, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hey, how you doing, Frank? Doing well. Um. Yeah, I had emailed you. Um. But. I have found out there's a $8,000 IRS lien in court uh, on me, and uh, I didn't know anything about it. Could I just go to the courthouse, get a, a certified copy of that, and then do the Chris D poll to that and send it in? And then um, I, I looked at the steps last night uh, on, you know, the process of doing the Chris D poll, um, just basically follow those steps and, and go from there. Yep, do exactly what you're doing. Yep, send a deed pile off. Get a copy of it. Send a deed pile off, absolutely. Okay. Now, is there a time limit to respond to, let's say, anything you get in the mail from the, I call them the ignorant ones? Um, sorry, can you repeat that? It was just hard to hear you. Sorry. Um, I see. Is there a time limit once you receive something in the mail from any one of the ignorant ones that for you to respond back with the Chris S. Depot or? Um, know, well, it, it, look, it, it really depends. But, yes, they normally put time limits on, on things in their system and then they play games around that. So I would jump on onto that. But, look, the thing about liens is effectively once they do it, it's it's running. So they don't even give you a, 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 a right of response. It's just there until you respond. It's a to respond to their ransom. So uh, I just go ahead and do it and then follow the time limits that we've set on our system for honour and dishonour. Yeah? 
Okay, okay, all right. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Ford Man. All right, uh, got a quick question here about a um, similar type question on the chat. What should I put uh, what should I put my EDP on the back of, and this is the continuation uh, explanation. I have an original citation from September, but the court date has been continued twice. I don't have an updated summons. So the question is, do they use the original one that they already have? Yeah. You can use any one of their documents that they send to you. A summons is better because of what a summons represents, but you can use any document that they send to you. And even if, by the way, you're not in front of a court matter, you can use a certified copy of a birth certificate and go back to the vital statistics if you were going to do an EDP and start to establish your position. So you don't need a court matter to, to start establishing your freedom of position. So the answer is any one of those documents is fine, but I would probably go back to the original and do it from the original, okay? Well, Frank, for um, a, a citation, I mean, technically in, in our experience over here, at the, the uh, citation is the summons. It, it gives you that court date. So an original citation could be treated as that original summons. Absolutely. Yep, good point. And sorry, I missed that. Well done. Thank you. Okay. No, that, that just kind of jumped, jumped in at me. So now uh, that, continuing on in the process there, uh, there's been some questions coming about regarding the procedure to monetize the liens once, once the yep. uh, uh, dishonor occurs. So could, could you maybe explain a little bit on that? Look, I'm going to talk a bit about it, but I'm not going to talk a lot. Okay. In, in, in the days and weeks ahead, I'll have more to talk about it because there is actually a, a probably a 90 day, well, there is in fact a 90 day window having sent all your deeds through uh, before you would be even trying to um, send it through. But the way, and I know for people say, okay, 10 minutes, 10 minutes got to be nice. But remember, the system's going to fight all the way. There, there is four forms of the bill, and the four forms that it goes through is based on the fundamental principles of uh, monetizing sin, which the, Florent, the Florentine and the Venetian system and then the Jesuit system perfected to become our modern commercial system. So we're using the uh, intrinsic rules of their system which, by the way, most of their own haven't got a clue. So a true bill is actually, to begin with, a bill of lading, and that's what you send on the dishonour. And then once a bill of lading is, uh, is not honoured, then we can move to a draft bill, uh, where we're dealing with a drawer, drawer, drawee. And then we, by when we send that draft bill, we really have sent the, the bill second time. So then when we... Um, uh, get a second dishonour, we can move to uh, applying a lien because we've now had two dishonours. And then the next form that comes through is called an accepted bill. And the reason it's called an accepted bill is that the dishonour twice is showing a delinquency and that delinquency allows us to issue a lien, an agricultural lien, and have it registered under UCC and then that acceptance at 90 degrees becomes the lien. The lien becomes as if the clerk of the courts signed the bill themselves in their system, and that becomes an accepted bill. It's not yet uh, an um, endorsed, perfected asset, but it is an unsecured asset at that point. So an accepted bill... It is bankable. You could go and take an accepted bill to the bank and have it deposited at that point if you want. But a bank would then say it is not underwritten and the bank itself could say we don't choose to underwrite it. Or if they do choose to underwrite it, say we'll discount it at 50%. In other words, they'll take 50% fees, you'll get 50% and that's it. Given that the clerks and the judges and the prosecutors are underwritten by the state with public hazard bonds. It means that once you've got a lien there, 
you can then call, which we're doing in the in the fourth uh, D, to the Attorney General to go and have that bond seized. Now, will the Attorney General do it? Well, I don't know. It's a 50-50. Some will, some won't. We are dealing in uncertain times, and arrogance and stupidity knows no bounds at the moment. But at 90 days maturing, then the underwriting and the Attorney General and the correspondence on that becomes the underwriting on the back of the accepted bill as the endorsement. The bank does not need to endorse the bill whatsoever. And now what you have is you have an endorsed bill, you have the highest form of asset because it is a underwritten asset. It's an asset underwritten by insurance. And when you go and deposit that in your trust special deposit account, you should be able to draw on that immediately because it is a fully A-grade underwritten financial instrument. Okay? Now, we'll talk about more of that in, in coming weeks. There is some background on the site. There'll be more background. I ask for your patience on that. So if there are follow-up questions, um, just be patient because there'll be more explanation of how that all works. Okay? Great. Thank you, Frank. All right. So we have genetic memory. Uh, you're unmuted. you have a question for Frank? Genetic memory. Hello? Hello. Not hearing genetic memory. Are you there? All right. Let me uh, go ahead to the next one. Shanbo. Shanbo, are you there? Hello? You question? Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi, Frank. This is Bob. I'm in Washington. Uh, Hi, Bob. Just had a little experience to relate. Uh, I was in court December 9th, and I did a deed poll. Didn't go in the bar. I read it on the record, and they kind of ignored that to start with. And he said he'd just find it committed. And I said, well, I didn't say I wouldn't enter. Anyhow, to make a long story short, I did that, went through this stuff. And uh, afterwards, the prosecutor, I saw him after court. And he said, you know, you don't have to bring these all to court, and you can come talk to me, and I understand how they'd be your friend and stuff. And he told me, he said, you know, you really have no place to go with this. And I said, well, what about the state court administrator? And he just looked at me and said, well, and walked away. And I was curious. I have a citation here. They're issuing these bills, I agree, under the UCC. It says Washington Uniform Court Docket. So basically, we're just getting a bill from the court, the way it appears. Uh, would there be anything wrong to going to their their controllers with the deed poll, like the state court administrator? Um, when you when you issue a deed poll, what you are trying to do is you're trying to issue it to the right spot where someone in that venue is presently acting in some fiduciary role relating to your trusts. So when a matter comes before a court, you know at least someone in that court, the judge, the clerk and the prosecutor are acting in some fiduciary roles relating to your trust, even though they don't admit to it. Yeah? Right. So that's that's why you serve it to them because they have an obligation at that point and they have a direct relationship to you at that point to perform, whether they choose to or not. And, of course, we're dealing with liars, yeah? I agree with that. Uh, at the time, I wasn't aware of the clerk thing. I did the one to the judge and the prosecutor. Uh, could not you do it to all? Well, well, this is the thing. I mean, the executives and administrators are all those people. It's a matter of following through with that and then going after all their deed, uh, all their public hazard bonds, the judge, the prosecutor, uh, and the clerk. Yeah? You're not going after one. You're going after all of them. Right. Yeah? But, but really, once you start the process, it's about seeing it through and not being sidetracked. If you go to a, a different court, if that court does not have 
at that moment 